Okay, and good day. Welcome to our season finale. Yeah, I think this is somewhat a fitting episode since this would be the day before the elections. And this is also be the day before, hopefully, my eye surgery. Uh, maybe for the first season, I would have 10 episodes with the finale being the culmination of um, supposedly the culmination of all the lectures that I have uh, conducted and at the same time um, a wake-up call for me since um, if I would like to set my mind into becoming a lawyer I have to start discussing more about my studies and the more I end up discussing my studies I end up remembering them and hopefully I would be closer to the goal of attaining or passing the bar exam so this would be if we, if this would take longer than expected it's because I had it packed with so much data maybe the case may not be local yet but it would provide an insight as to what uh, opportunities lay ahead of you and perhaps to be honest as well about how difficult it is to conduct legal research you may not be a legal researcher like that in in the court like a regional trial court but um, since it's already it um, a task uh, that some virtual assistants have been doing you might as well have an idea how it would be it would be research intensive but as long as you have an idea of where to research the data then it would be good so to begin internet research well the biggest challenge today is in conducting research that is verifiable uh, and to the credible verifiable and to a point honest so what made internet research hard well oh there was some edits that i have not done there anyway you find information in one source and try verifying it in another source like there's this case digest and if you you have read some case digest before court decisions uh, they would usually uh, end or the final part of the decision would be supported by um, one by law like legal provisions article number section number and then the other source would be the previous decision conducted by the Supreme Court or by another court so next is you try to find any connections between the two or more sources well because there are some court decisions that have um, two references making it three like there's the legal provision then there's the case digest like the Supreme Court has decided in a previous case and the Supreme Court decided in another case such examples exist and then of course perhaps the toughest is that you, pr you suppress any confirmation bias if any before any results come up like especially whenever it involves a criminal case like as much as possible even you have a little hint that the person accused of a crime might be guilty you also need to remember that uh, okay he was accused he looked guilty he looked disheveled like or he had if uh, some judges uh, would um, eventually say he had a face that only a mother could love quite savage but yeah some judges are ended up becoming judges because they are savage <laughs> at their judgment so as much as possible you don't want to rely on their appearances uh, that much you want to rely on the evidence that is presented in court which makes you understand why some some people who are accused of certain things whenever they appear in court they make sure that they are dressed well so at least 
there would be a little sympathy earned, as they say. Anyway, so verifying information is hard. What made it harder is how the main sources of information tend to delete them online. This is usually the case whenever some of the pieces of evidence that will make your case stronger are found on the internet like posts on social media. So you are then left to dig for screenshots if some people manage to preserve some screenshots. So this take note here and maybe this will be my mantra eventually. Um, this this is what I quoted from the New James Version of the Bible. I, I have yet to check the Catholic version of the Bible for this, but yeah, you have here Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31, verse 6, wherein the Lord says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God will never leave you nor forsake you. So I know it's a Sunday today, but it's one of those quotes that I really search online because it's invo it involves uh, the main person that we'll be talking about in this episode since this is his favorite Bible quote and turns out to be very applicable to his current situation. Not that I'm biased or anything, but you will see later on the details as we continue because this is the favorite quote of this guy, Vic Mignona. Otherwise, no, he's a voice actor. Um, he used to be with um, this American company named Funimation. Uh, and one of his most famous characters voiced is Edward Elric, uh, the main character from Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, this is one of his uh, earliest uh, claims to fame. Here in the Philippines, I'm familiar with Full Metal Alchemist, but I think the voice actor for that for the Filipino dub version is a female or or a child, since it shows here that Edward is still young. And the other claim to fame of uh, Vic Mignona is Broly, because there was there's Super Broly, the latest uh, Dragon Ball movie. Um, was entitled Dragon Ball Z Super Broly and uh, he was the voice uh, for he was the voice actor for Broly I've you may check out uh, some clips on YouTube on how he sounds like because um, the theatrical background that Big Minion had helped in voicing such outrageous characters we're talking about uh, anime characters so they're really wild so what does it have to do here? Why is he the main focus here? And what does it have to do with legal research? Well, um, according to the website uh, io9.gizmodo, one of anime's biggest voices accused of sexual harassment. So this is an article written by Beth Elderkin. And to read, last summer, voice actor Vic Mignogna went into a booth with a few others to record audio for a video game. Yes, he also dubs for a video game. At one point, Vic Mignona asked the client who was overseeing the session if she was okay with his performance. When she didn't answer right away, he followed up with, you know the old Latin or is it Greek? There's an axiom that says, silence gives consent. Stories about Mignona having been circulating online for over a decade, including through the Tumblr blog, Dear Vic Magnogna, that's how they actually spelled it, but the latest round of accusations started surfacing around mid-January of this year. io9 spoke with more than 25 voice actors, cosplayers, industry professionals, convention employees, and former fans about their experiences with Mignona. Uh, many of them asked not to be named in fear of retaliation from Mignona or his fan base. These, along with the testimonials circulating online, paint a picture of a 56-year-old man who aggressively hugs, grabs, touches, kisses, and propositions women, often without asking for their consent. 
It happens at panels, in autograph lines, at private events, and behind closed doors. His behavior has become so known in the anime and convention communities that it's more than an open secret. Well, it just so happened here that Minyona himself learned of these accusations and posted a statement. Uh, this one is a screenshot recorded uh, from the YouTube clip. Um, yeah, this is an example of um, a reference that I have. If you're already uh, an expert in research, you may be familiar with this bibliography. So anyway, just to read the statement of Mignana. My desire has always been to show appreciation, warmth, and acceptance to fans of my work. Being part of this community has given both my work and my life so much meaning. If anyone has been made uncomfortable by me, it's not for me to contradict them. It's impossible for me to discern other person's personal boundaries. Another's personal boundaries, I'm sorry about that. I regret anything I have said or done out of ignorance that has put anyone outside of the comfort zone. I love my work dearly as well as the characters I've had the privilege to portray. But most satisfyingly of all has been the opportunity to share that love of this art form with fans all around the world. I would never have met any of you without it. Meeting each of you has so enriched my life and I'm humbled to have received over a thousand encouraging messages in the last few weeks. To my colleagues, I have considered you good friends for so many years. We've shared countless wonderful experiences together and I never meant to do anything to offend or hurt you. Until these last few weeks, I had no idea that any animosity even existed. I've never had anything but respect for you, and I so deeply regret any words or actions that made any one of you feel otherwise. In many respects, life is about course correction and growth. So many fans have written me over the years about their very personal issues and struggles, and I've always done my best to encourage and support them. The truth is that I am just as susceptible to struggles and difficulties as anyone. I haven't identified areas in which I need growth, and I am taking this time to recommit to God and seeking the help of a counselor. I am committed to putting every effort into improving not only for myself, but for everyone I interact with. Each of you deserves nothing less. Finally, please be kind to one another. The very last thing I want is for anyone to be hatefully targeted, especially not in my behalf. Most sincerely, Vic Mignona. So he acknowledged the inappropriate behavior and apologized for it. But was it enough? Well, Funimation fired him. What proof was used? Also, who are the complainants? So... First, what was the proof used? Some questions arose the moment they check on the proof used. Here's a screen. Here's a few screenies by a Twitter user named Kung Fu Man. When he said, he tweeted right after this uh, issue exploded online. Hey, Anime Newsnet. Anime Newsnet is the one of the first websites that published the news ahead of io9 where it shows a picture of a girl that was uh, used as an example for the for the complaints of in of set inappropriate uh, behavior in anime conventions so this there's this one tweet and then there's several screenshots one picture was pixelated and then on the other screen wherein Kung Fu Man got to screenshot the statement of the girl, one of the girls that were uh, kissed 
So, in other words, she's not the complainant. Her picture was used without permission to use as evidence against the big Mignana. And she spoke up online to prove that her picture was not, or the picture was used without her consent. So she says here, um, there is a photo also going around with Vic, giving me a kiss on the cheek, and they are falsely stating, I was 20 years of age in 2012. I am only 21 now. This particular photo was taken in Manchester at the Harrison Boy Ranger dinner that I set up that my mother was present at along with other parents. I requested these photos myself and the mom's and Vic's consent. I do not want to be involved in any negativity towards Vic and cause him any distress or bad press. Vic is a genuinely nice man who I admire and looked up to for many years. In no way have I got anything to do with the negativity towards Vic or the allegations. Seeing this has distressed me tonight, and I wanted to set the record straight. Keep your head up, Vic, and try to rise above it. So, the caption that Kung Fu Man placed here, yeah, what I mentioned a while ago. First image is the mosaic one you claim was a non-consensual pass. Second is the victim themselves saying you're fabricating stuff. You, meaning the people accusing uh, Vic Mignon of inappropriate behavior. And then the third is a reaction image, just in case you don't understand those, yeah. So yeah, that's a reaction image. You know how memes work, right? Sometimes they are placed there for the sake of emphasizing a reaction. So the information used for the internal investigation was based on the complaint of Monica Real. So who is Monica Real? She is the voice actor for Bulma, also of uh, Dragon Ball Z, and she's also an employee of Funimation. So her complaint was used for the investigation. So here is the article by Anime News Network uh, that is mentioning the incident that occurred. And uh, just to read, Bulma voice actress Monica Real shares a legged inappropriate encounters with Vic Mignana. So Real has been attacked with threats since publicly accusing Mignana. Voice actress Monica Real posted a message on her Twitter account on Tuesday describing her past encounters with voice actor Vic Mignana, saying that Mignana would take a fist full of my hair, pull my head back, and either whisper so closely to my ear that his lips were touching or kiss my neck or cheek or neck and um, every time he saw Riel. These actions are similar to the actions that fellow voice actress Jamie Marchi or Jamie Markey accused Mignon of doing to her. Yes, it's also another tweet. Riel added that she and others have witnessed Mignon performing the same actions to both colleagues and fans. Rial also described another incident where she claimed that Mignona had forcibly kissed her in his hotel room during convention in the mid 2000s. After Mignona invited Rial to his room supposedly to watch a video, Rial claims she has been threatened and doxed, doxed meaning the act of finding and sharing sensitive information about a person. Um, after she first shared her inappropriate encounters with Mignona earlier this month, meaning February, and implied in her message that she was receiving threatening phone calls and has been in contact with law enforcement to ensure her safety. Rial is one of the many people, both inside and outside the enemy industry, who have publicly accused Mignana of kissing and embracing them without consent over the course of his career, with some allegations dating back to 1989. These allegations have spread on social media over the past few weeks. Fellow voice actors have publicly issued anecdotes of their personal experiences with Min Mignana or support for those speaking out via social media. Um, just to note, those voice actors are uh, mostly involved with Funimation and mostly voice actors of Dragon Ball Z. Okay, so Mignona issued a statement on February 13, 
one I read a while ago. In the statement, Mignon apologizes for anything he has said or done out of ignorance and states he was unaware of any animosity that existed between himself and his colleagues and apologizes for any words or actions that made them feel disrespected. Finally, Mignon states that he is taking his time to recommit to God and seeking help from a counselor to improve. So he, another company that uh, Mignon has worked for is Rooster Teeth, wherein it's mentioned here, Rooster Teeth has replaced Mignon in the cast of Ruby. It's a W, I know, but uh, people online read it as you, Ruby. It's one of those uh, anime streamed online where Mignon used to be. And then Funimation confirmed its recast for the Morose Mononokian 2 and severed its relationship with Mignona earlier this month, meaning February. So many of Mignona's convention appearances have been canceled and Mignona issued a statement on the matter last week. So I should have made a screenshot of that anyway. Um, so most of the sources here are from Monica Rial's Twitter account. So note how the reference used for the article simply state Monica Rial's Twitter uh, statements from Mignana and statement uh, from Funimation and Rooster Teeth. So no police report, no charges filed in court. So of course there would be some skeptics um, questioning the procedure. Wherein, yeah, you have pictures like these of Rial and Mignana wherein um, there's this screenshot that was taken um, asking directly, Realism is the Twitter handle of Monica Rial, saying that really asked her if she's really uncomfortable with Mignona, how come she lasted working with him for 15 years and never spoke a word. Like, it doesn't look like sexual assault here. Anyway, and then here another tweet, this time by Vic Mignona himself, um, sharing how one of his uh, meetings with the other voice actors with Dragon Ball Z and then Monica Riel was um, screenshot here saying it was so much fun so yeah it immediately put doubt to the accusations so anyone skeptical of the charges made were replied to by Riel of course he replied to them saying that Thank you for sending this my way. Referring to some of the tweets asking her about stuff. So you realize that's harassment, right? My lawyer will be contacting you. Have a nice day. And it sounded like it escalated quickly. So yeah, in what regard is the harassment? Please elaborate. So you're spreading a slanderous video and have a nice day. Like, Sometimes you, you're trying to find the logic here, so here. Uh, at first, it looks like a typo, as you will see in, in some of the uh, screenshots later, because here she is explaining herself, so, saying that in, just so we're clear, he's the legal definition of harassment, like using a person to define harassment. Harassment is governed by state laws, uh, generally defined as a course of conduct which annoys, threatens, intimidates, alarms, or puts a person in fear of their safety. Freedom of speech does not equal freedom from consequence. Before you choose to harass me, please be aware <clears throat> that I have attorneys and law enforcement involved. <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. I just. <laughs> anyway, today we are talking all threats we are taking all threats harassment very serious any harassment threats will be screenshot and forwarded so and then she retweeted the tweet by funimation everyone we wanted to give an update on the vic mignona situation following an investigation funimation recast vic mignona in rose mononoke in season two uh funimation will not be engaging mignona in future productions so dated February 11, 2019. So, of course, there would be speculations again on 
the kind of investigation conducted here, it pushed one article writer by the pen name of Emperor Pyros, unless that's his real name. Uh, it says here that, to be completely honest with y'all, this whole Vic Mignogna debacle is very interesting. I wanted to talk about this for a very long time, but decided to wait a bit in order to see if more information would come out. It's been a couple of weeks since then, and nothing new has developed. So I thought I'd share my thoughts on this I stand with Vic, kick Vic topic now. Those are the two hashtags that trended. So how this whole thing allegedly even started in the first place, that a fan, actually this is how it started, he mentioned. A fan brought a Yaoi pick of Broly for Vic design. Uh, Yaoi is an uh, anime that featured uh, illustrate, illustration or illustrated uh, a couple of men in a sexualized pose. So it's not clear what kind of uh, poster was that that Vic Mignogna refused to sign. Um, Vic refused to sign it, just to continue with the article. Vic refused to sign it, stating that he didn't want to sign something that didn't represent the character and wasn't canon. Um, when you say canon, anything that is accepted in the narrative and the story, it's like, usually canon is used as a term whenever saying that, whenever they're describing Broly, because remember, Broly is not, a character in the TV series is more a character in the films, in the individual films, Dragon Ball films. Um, and whenever they say it's canon, meaning anything that is accepted in the narrative, it's quite a complicated topic. Anyway, to continue, this logic makes sense to me given the climate we're in in 2019. This obviously sparked an outrage among a small group of people and soon enough snowballed in the internet where it went out of control. So Broly refusing to sign an auto, uh, sign um, an artwork, a fan art, that featured some characters of Dragon Ball Z in uh, a yaoi position. Uh, that's how it started out. It started the rumor that Mignogna was a homophobe, or he just ref he just used the Dragon Ball canon not to sign it. Um, either way, there were some people that were bitter that he refused to sign a certain fan art. So, also, this tweet did not age well. So, yeah, there was there was back in twenty fifteen there were some questions um, given to Rial and Marky about. Um, Monica, if you spent the day with Renge from The Lovely Show, that is, I'm not familiar with that program, what would you guys do? Okay, and then they said, harass Vic Mignogna. So, the tweet obviously did not age well. Maybe they did not foresee that um, about some years down the line, they would be having this issue with Vic Mignogna. So, another tweet that did not age well was posted by the other Fanimation employee mentioned in the Anime News Network article, Jamie Markey. And this might be repeated later on in a document that I, would, uh, I will read in snippets. Markey said, Yes, I want his head. I want his balls. I want him to feel an ounce of the pain he's caused others and then fucking choke on it. I want you to take this dick out of your ears so you can actually hear reality. But you know, that's just me. This really put Jamie Mark in a lot of trouble since uh, really it's some would go as far as this is similar to a grave threat, but grave threat. Some sounds like a grave threat actually. And then, instead of proof that Mignola touched conference goers without their consent or was being inappropriate in terms of behavior, screenshots of conspiracy were leaked. So this is where it really starts getting interesting. So there's this picture posted 
also uh, posted uh, on Twitter a screenshot taken from Facebook about Vic Mignona being uh, hugging a conference goer. She's obviously wearing um, cosplay. She's in cosplay mode. She asked for an autograph and then a photo opportunity with Vic Mignona. And then here it was posted on Facebook. So it looks like a Facebook screenshot. And then um, this was a screenshot shared by Twitter username Srito Binsu tagging some uh, other personalities that might be involved here wherein um, it shows how some people online were conspiring to against uh, Vic Mignogna. So just to read, uh, you should Photoshop that picture so it looks like Vic's hand is on your chest. That way no one can claim that it's out of context and it makes Vic look worse than he is. So yeah, here's the photo. And yeah, they might have attempted to Photoshop it, but it doesn't, it's not Photoshopped so far. So of course, somebody replied to that suggestion. Nah, falsifying evidence is gross. So if it, even if it helps make Vic look bad, even if it makes Vic look Hitler, look like Hitler, so. And then somebody was, Somebody, um, then, okay, just continue. Oh, that would be fun. Someone should add the Hitler mustache to him. Then again, we already know he hates Jews. Then somebody snapped, saying, why would you even suggest to edit evidence? That would pretty much throw, if out, throw it out or in a case of law, and it would bring doubt to other allegations. If anything, this should help him. And then Valerie Derpa, Valerie Depa replied, not if the Photoshop looks convincing. Like, oh no. So, yeah. Some people would insist on not doing the Photoshop. And then somebody mentioned, just don't do it. It's extremely harmful to the victims. And then Valerie replied, this is a closed group, so not everyone can see it. And then Mark replied, my point still stands. And then, so another person replied, yes, but I will call the F out of you if I do catch you spreading false evidence. So don't do it. Just because it's a closed group doesn't mean it's okay to make it up. So yeah, supported headed by the Minnesota-based lawyer, Nick Riqueta, then put up a GoFundMe page to raise funds needed for legal expenses in case that Mignona would decide to uh, take this to court. So here is the latest screenshot of the GoFundMe. And yeah, it was created February 19, 2019. There have been donations. There have been some donation donors that have been anonymous. The others really post their name out there. So yeah. In two months, they have already raised one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars, seven hundred fifty-two, or seven one hundred fifty-five thousand seven hundred fifty-two dollars of the two hundred thousand goal. Since they see a long battle ahead, so. What is Vic Mignogna left to do now? Well, he hired a lawyer named Ty Beard from the Beard Harris Bullock Hughes firm. He cannot hire Rick Riqueta since he is from Tarrant County in Texas. So in terms of jurisdiction, hiring Beard is his best decision ever. Also, the moment that it was confirmed that he was hired, he replied to one of uh, Monica Rial's biggest fans, of course, his fiance, regarding some stuff online. We will be in touch. So yeah. So I just can't find the screenshot anymore where Ron Toye was saying that this lawyer was harassing him when 
and on the other hand, this is one tweet that earned him the nickname One Tweet Lawyer, uh, obviously inspired by the animated series One Man Punch. If there's One Man Punch, there's One Tweet Lawyer. So, and that's Ty Beard. So, with some conspiracy uncovered, the demand for concrete evidence just got louder. So, yeah, since we already mentioned Ron Toye, we might as well discuss him. So, who is Ron Toye? Ron Toye is Monica Rial's fiance. It's not clear if he's also an employee of animation. But since the incident involved his fiance, he's been tweeting almost as often as Rial. And uh, Ty Beard's associates in the law firm mentioned that they have screenshot evidence uh, as many as 400 tweets, more than 400 tweets. So, and this is one of the 400 wherein he's replying to someone saying, this guy, the guy is an idiot and will be getting a cease and desist. The guy he's referring to is Vic Mignana. He clearly doesn't, or either he's referring to Vic Mignana or Ty Beard. He clearly doesn't understand how HR and the court system vary. It's okay. They are tr just trying to get hits. So it's when, when he says he's just trying to get hits, it's like on Twitter, you're just trying to get as many retweets as possible or replies. It makes you question sometimes uh, his agenda. So he even tried calling Beard's office to show that he's not afraid only for the other netizens to realize that he called on a Saturday. Because, yeah, he was bragging around on, hey, I tried calling, and then Ty Beard wasn't answering the phone. Like, and then the other people were like, of course you will not answer the phone. It's not a working day, it's a Saturday. So, yeah. Makes you doubt again the kind of uh, mentality that he has. And then, other tweets that were captured here? Um, yes, in fact, we will. If he feels we lied or anyone else, he should sue. The great news is the best defense against defamation is the truth. That's why he hasn't filed any lawsuit against us. But those who filed false claims will get sued. If we are lying, he should sue. We would love to go to court in the defamation case the person filing the suit has to prove she lied. The best defense against defamation, the truth. Like, oh God, he's, he's having some typos now. Okay, there's a reason there has been any defamation cases brought against people. So, yeah. The typos are, are, are kind of distracting, but then again, that should give you some confidence that, yeah, even Americans get a lot of typos in their tweets. So, another tweet here. I actually would love for this to go to court. Smiley face. Please let him sue. Smiley face. The best defense against libel defamation is the truth. Smiley face. The procession of people coming to the courtroom to share their testimony would be a magnificent sight to see. And then he attached an animated um, image. So yeah, to rephrase what some fans told Toye, be careful what you wish for. Like really, are you ready? And it's on. Victor Mignona, Plaintiff versus Funimation Productions, LLC. Jamie Markey, Monica Rial, and Ronald Toye. Plaintiff Victor Mignona complains of defendants Funimation Productions, LLC, Jamie Marquis, Monica Rial, Ronald Toye, and for such purposes we show discovery is entitled to be conducted pursuant to Texas Rule of Civil Procedure. So, the parties involved here, of course, have, we've already mentioned Vic Mignona, uh, Funimation is involved in the case. While they are based in Delaware, um, since they are based in Delaware, certain provisions of the law had to be mentioned to explain why they 
why the jurisdiction applies to them as well since the party that's complaining is based in Texas in uh, Tarrant County so and then of course the individual parties I I blacked out their addresses because <laughs> the funny thing here is when someone leaked out this uh, document they forgot to uh, they forgot to black out the addresses so yeah it's um, he accidentally doxed uh, those individuals but for the address of animation they have a registered agent so this is not they have a okay so uh, oh by the way here's the explanation why they are this applies to them defendant Funimation productions llc is a delaware limited liability company with its principal place of business in denton county texas but does not maintain a registered agent in the state of texas so therefore there the someone should be served at a, a texas-based uh, address okay so yeah they are the defendants here are first name basis okay jurisdiction and venue and it makes you shake your head at times because later on we would explain how this amount is justified the subject matter in controversy is within the jurisdictional limits of this court plaintiff plaintiff seeks monetary relief over one million dollars this court is jurisdiction over jamie monica and ronald because they are residents of texas and be funimation because it has conducted business in texas venue is proper in this court under texas civil practice and remedies code section 15.017 because civic lived in tarrant county at the time his causes of action accrued yeah causes of action is often discussed in remedial law that's how i check on my reviews okay so facts of the case translation what happened based on factual evidence okay since this ex this actually summarized a, what a lot uh, of people on youtube and twitter already knew and facebook social media in effect um they also had to explain here anime since uh, this is in consideration of uh, judges or members of the jury that are not familiar with anime so they have to explain here what being a voice actor means and then yeah they also mentioned that monica and jamie are voice actors and ronald is a fiance and either a funimation agent or employee it's not so clear but his actions make it seem so which is why he's included in this um in this case he's among the defendants so to summarize here funimation primarily dubs japanese anime properties into english for distribution like for example dragon ball is a property of toei animation and then funimation has a license to distribute dragon ball in the united states using uh, streaming access subscription services so it's on the website so since uh, it is dubbed uh, it will be featuring american voice actors so for example in 2018 vic was cast as the english voice for broly uh, i know some people will be correcting this because it says here the lead character in the fantasy martial arts anime film dragon ball super broly mm. the cast also included monica she's the voice of bulma and then dragon ball super broly was released in the u.s january 16. um which is why i have yet to see dragon ball super broly here in the philippines so okay the film itself earned seven million dollars on the first day and 24 million dollars within the first five days of its premiere so in addition to his voice work vic attends fan conventions approximately 35 to 40 per year so if that's if that's 35 to 40 per year that's almost 
three to four conventions per month. So he earns a sizable income for appearance fees guaranteed by contract with the convention producers and from signing autographs, taking photos with fans and appearing on guest panels. Uh, and then by January 16, he already had accepted invitations with dozens of conventions for appearances in 2019. On January 16, the day Dragon Ball Super Bowl released in the U.S., Monica liked and retweeted the tweet of someone with the Twitter handle Hanlea that accused Vic of being a homophobic rude asshole who has been creepy to underage female fans over 10 years. So just a disclaimer, I'm still clueless as to who this Hanlea is and I am not sure if she would be included in another lawsuit soon. It's not even sure. On, what's clear here is that Monica liked and retweeted. That's how it all started, by liking and retweeting some tweet that mentioned Vic Mignon of being a homophobe. So, the next day, Monica liked and retweeted two tweets by Kaylin Saucedo, who posts under the username Mars Girl, that accused Vic of great volumes of sexual misconduct. Yeah, one of uh, the one of the personalities that people refer to as the one that started the Kick Vic movement. Hashtag Kick Vic movement was a Mars girl. So yeah, um, and then the repeated attention that Monica, Jamie, and even Funimation's agents, employees, or business partners gave Hanley's and Mars Girl's accusations, caused their tweets to go viral, quote unquote. About the same time, one or more defendants began, began actively defaming Vic directly to anime conventions, speaking of investigations, and Vic being fired. So in other words, they're not just tweeting stuff on social media or posting stuff on social media. They're also informing the convention organizers to about issues that they have with Vic Mignogna. So, barely a week later, Tammy Denbo, a Sony executive, informed Vic she was investigating three allegations of sexual harassment against him. One, Monica alleged to have occurred six years prior at a convention, not at any Funimation or Sony facility or event, when after she wrote her name on a jelly bean and gave it to him, Vic ate the jelly bean and joked that he, quote unquote, ate Monica. So this is about uh, a jelly bean. It's, I don't eat jelly beans. So continue. Vic denied any sexual suggestion. He was joking in response to a fan's asking if he could be poisoned by the ink. So it's like a convention and then... Monica signed her autograph on the jelly bean. Vic Mignogna ate the jelly bean. And then he joked that he ate Monica. Okay. And then another alleged. Okay. Another alleged inappropriate conduct between. Okay. Another alleged inappropriate conduct between Vic and two fans. Not Funimation or Sony employees. At a convention three years prior, again, not at any Funimation or Sony facility or event, Vic emphatically denied any inappropriate conduct. The third allegation involved a single consensual kiss between Vic and a Funimation employee who was Vic's friend. It's not clear which friend was it. Okay, so then Bo telling Vic that her investigation was a confidential matter did not stop Jamie, Monica, and Ronald or other Funimation employees or business partners from urging anime conventions and other studios to terminate their contracts with Vic, telling some that Funimation was conducting an investigation into allegations that Vic was a sexual predator or that charges were being filed against Vic and he would soon be arrested or tweeting details about the investigation. For example, 
Ronald would tweet on February 2, 2019, that Vic is a predator based on his insider knowledge about Sony's investigation. That is one reason why there's speculation or there is a perception that Ronald Toye is an employee because he's claiming insider knowledge. And then, okay, continue. The fallout from the defendant's actions was swift. On January 18, 2019, the Phoenix Fan Fusion Convention canceled Vic's appearance. Lost income. Lost income right there. A few days later, on January 26, 2019, Ronald tweeted that Vic was a predator, a charge Ronald would repeat in at least 15 more tweets. Shortly after, the Ranger Stop Convention canceled Vic's appearance, another lost opportunity to earn income. On January 29, 2019, Denbo, another Sony, and another Sony executive, informed Vic that his employment with Funimation was terminated following Denbo's investigation. By the way, just to clarify, um, Funimation invested, or Sony invested into Funimation making Sony uh, one of the executives authorized to investigate into the situation. Okay, and then on January 30, 2019, both the Anime NYC and the Anime Milwaukee conventions canceled Vic's appearances. And then January 31, 2019, tweets, tweets dated January 31, 2019, Ronald claimed to know of at least four assaults by Vic and crowed. Sorry about that. I'm glad to see conventions canceled that day. Kawaii Kon canceled Vic's appearance. That's not exactly the kind of tweet you should be saying about someone losing income opportunities, but there it is, evidence. So on February 1, 2019, Ronald tweeted he personally knew that Vic was guilty of at least four accounts that day. The Kamehakon Dallas Convention canceled Vic's appearance. However, on March 24, 2019, Vic was re-invited to the Kamehakon, Kamehakon Dallas Convention. So it's, this is one anime convention themed um, Dragon Ball with the Dragon Ball theme and the only one so far that reversed its decision to cancel Vic Mignogna's appearance. Okay, to continue, on February 2, 2019, Ronald tweeted that Vic needed to prove himself not to be a predator. The next day, Ancient CityCon canceled Vic's appearance, lost income opportunity. And on February 4, 2019, Ronald multi tweeted multiple times that Vic was a predator, called Vic a perp, and asserted that there are over 100 accounts and still more to come. So this is figure one, why it resulted to so many tweets because Rontoye is shown as one that would be replying to multiple Twitter users constantly mentioning Vic Mignon as a predator and then about being doing inappropriate behavior like this screenshot here. He's down because he took advantage of girls, buddy. How about get a grip on reality and stop harassing people? Over 100 accounts and still more to come. And you defend the sack of... Mm, get a light. So, yeah, it, it's, been, it's been a narrative that he maintained all throughout the tweets. So, and then February 5, 2019. Funimation informed Anime News Network that Vic's employment has been terminated. And Ronald again tweeted his accusation that Vic is a predator. Over the next 24 hours, Florida Supercon, Raleigh Supercon, Comic-Con, and Hudson Valley Comic-Con all canceled Vic appearance, Vic's appearances. Too many to handle within the next 24 hours, if you would ask me. 
Okay, and then on February 5, 2019, Funimation informed Anime News Network that Vic's employment had been terminated and Ronald again tweeted his accusation that Vic is a predator. Over the next 24 hours, oh, yeah, I already read that. Sorry about that. Then on February 6, 2019, Ronald tweeted that over 100 women had made accusations of assault, that the allegations against Vic were corroborated, that there were mountains of testimony, and that Funimation have proof. That's why they fired him. Monica, Ronald's fiance, also tweeted on February 6 that it happened to me. And that, to quote, I'm only one voice on a sea of many. He's hurt enough people. He's a sick man and he needs help. End quote. Later that day, Jamie attempted to rebuff those questioning the veracity of Monica's post on Twitter, which leads us to the next screenshot. I already mentioned this a while ago. Then again, some of the replies that Tie Beard considered to be crucial to the case was also included here. Wherein somebody replied to Marky's tweet, and what about innocent until proven guilty? Marky replied, works in a court of law. Sometimes name and shame is the fastest way to the courtroom. So it makes you realize the kind of understanding they have of the law. Name and shame is not always synonymous to proving that someone is guilty. Anyway, later that day, Monica declared that Vic is the legal definition of harassment. So yeah, you, you may remember me mentioned this a while ago, and we thought that it's a typo, but then again, it's not actually a typo. We're in real mention, and so we're clear He's the le legal definition of harassment. So an, in Monica Real's dictionary, when, whenever she looks at the definition of harassment, the name she sees is Vic Mignana. So and then she elaborated that harassment is governed by state laws, but is generally defined as a course of conduct which annoys, threatens, intimidates, alarms, or puts a person in fear of their safety. So over the next week or so, Ronald tweeted evidence he has been fired, there was an investigation, these actions have corroborated testimony, and then another tweet dated February 13, 2019. Oh, yeah, that was the tweet dated February 13, 2019. And then in the tweet dated February 18, 2019, their decision was on things that happened to Funimation employees. And then another tweet dated February 16, 2019. Let's see who walks away a registered sex offender. So he keeps on tweeting. They're just tweeting continuously without providing any proof. Without it providing any proof and mentioning things that are supposed to be confidential. So if Ronald has access or Ronald Toye has access to those uh, pieces of confidential information, does that make him an employee? And well, spoiler alert, he has not replied yet to request to, to appear for, yeah, like, you have the opportunity to answer for these accusations. Huh? He's supposed to appear, but he has not done so. Anyway. So, February 19, 2019, Monica tweeted a lengthy post in which she accused Vic of sexual harassment, kissing her without her consent and treating others similarly at conventions. Uh, she claimed to have spoken with investigators to corroborate the testimony of others telling stories similar to hers and spoke of Funimation's investigations. So another screenshot was attached here saying that the investigations were incredibly thorough. Each person was interviewed, the evidence weighed, and the decision made. Each company has to look out for the safety of their employees. In this instance, these companies felt 
they made the best decision to protect their employees and contract workers. Also, these companies aren't obligated to share any information with you. Many of the women who have come forward have chosen to remain anonymous, especially after seeing the way I've been attacked. Please respect their privacy. Okay, mm, just to continue. So, Ronald has continued carpet bombing. That's the term that Ty Beard used in the document. Ronald has continued carpet bombing Vic on Twitter, accusing him of assaulting, quote unquote, Monica in a tweet dated February 21, 2019, of cheating on his fiance, assaulting ladies and robbing fans, and assaulting way more people than Monica on a tweet dated February 23, 2019, and forcing himself on people in a sexual manner without consent and that resulted in assault in another tweet dated April 7, 2019. So, you can only imagine how many tweets were used as evidence here. Rules of electronic evidence come to mind uh, whenever tweets or posts on social media are used as evidence against the person. Okay, so to continue, in fact, Ronald, a Funimation agent or employee, has tweeted more than 80 times that Vic sexually assaulted or assaulted Monica. I got the idea of 400 tweets uh, since there were some interviews where um, Ty Beard and some of his associates were interviewed saying that almost 400 tweets were gathered and 80 of them were tweets that uh, mentioned how Ronald claimed in those tweets that Vic sexually assaulted or assaulted Monica. So, they simply categorized them into the times that he called Vic a sexual predator, about Vic allegedly assaulting Monica. Yeah, certain information that sometimes you just go repeated over and over in all those tweets. So, you then realize here about if the if all they have are tweets and not pieces of evidence and then they have been claiming that several people have come forward and they find it justifiable to fire Vic Mignana for inappropriate behavior, then what is left of for Vic Mignana to do then? So we can then check on the claims. So, Victor Mignona versus Funimation et al. First claim is defamation on whether or not defamation occurred. Okay, this is one of the claims uh, posted in, uh, in, this cla in this document. The preceding paragraphs are incorporated by reference. In the in the document that was uh, used by several uh, YouTubers as reference here, the, the exhibits, some of the exhibits are actually already mentioned in line since they are mostly tweets. And then the defendants, according to this document, have tweeted false defamatory statements about Vic that were published and read by third parties. Indeed, many of the defendants' tweets are defamatory per se. The defendants knew these statements were false or made them with negligent disregard for their truthfulness. Due to the defendant's defamation, Vic has suffered actual and consequential damages in excess of the minimal jurisdictional amounts of this court, as well as damage to his reputation. So if you have enumerated all of the anime conventions that canceled uh, Mignona's appearance, then you can also calculate or at least estimate the amount or income lost. And then the defendant's conduct was willful, fraudulent, malicious, and in wanton disregard for Vic, thereby entitling him to punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial. So the $1 million amount mentioned earlier in this document 
that's the minimum. So if ever there are any punitive damages to be determined, they will be determined in the trial itself. And then, second claim, tortious interference with existing contracts. This is one thing I might verify later on once I started reviewing civil law. It's one of those uh, topics uh, discussed. They're more known, and I'm more familiar in them in civil law as torts. So, okay, tortious interference with existing contracts, whether or not interference occurred. Here, it was explained wherein Vic enjoyed contracts with multiple conventions prior to the defendant's tortious conduct. However, the defendants willfully and intentionally interfered with these contracts, approximately causing cancellation, termination, even breach of those contracts by the convention producers, thereby causing big actual and consequential damages in excess of the minimal jurisdictional amounts of this court. And the defendant's conduct was willful, fraudulent, malicious, and in wanton disregard for Vic, thereby entitling him to punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial. So it's not enough for the defendants to tweet several times over about being predator, about being sexual, about sexual assault, about inappropriate behavior. They made sure that the convention organizers are informed of these tweets, of these allegations thrown against Vic Mignogna, making them cancel Vic Mignogna's appearance in those anime conventions and making him lose income in the process. So next claim, Tortuous interference with prospective business relations. This is quite related to the previous uh, claim mentioned. There was reasonable probability that Vic would have entered into agreements with other production companies and conventions. However, the defendant's unlawful actions prevented these relationships from occurring. So they're like, agreements that did not materialize because somebody interfered. So the defendant's unlawful actions were taken without justification or cause. Indeed, the defendants were motivated by malice. The defendant's tortuous interference proximately caused big actual and consequential damages, including lost profits in excess of the minimal jurisdictional amounts of this court. The defendant's conduct was willful, fraudulent, malicious, and in wanton disregard for Vic, thereby entitling him to punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial. And then, finally, civil conspiracy, whether or not conspiracy occurred. So, the defendants are mentioned in this document where it said, the defendants conspired and acted in concert to defame Vic, interfere with his existing contracts, and interfere with his prospective business relations, and each knowingly assisted and participated in the other actions. The defendant civil conspiracy proximately caused Vic actual and consequential damages, including lost profits in excess of the minimal jurisdictional amounts of this court for which each of the defendants is jointly and severely liable with other defendants. The defendant's conduct was willful, fraudulent, malicious, and in wanton disregard for Vic, thereby entitling him to punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial for which each of the defendants is jointly and severely liable with other defendants. As doubt was cast over the internal investigation following the interrogator oh, okay. as doubt was cast over the internal investigation conducted, the following interrogatories were prayed for. Okay, what is asked for from Funimation in in particular? Well, the specific definitions 
without limiting the definitions provided by the Texas Rules of Evidence or the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure or the ordinary definitions ascribed to the following terms, the term communication includes email, text messages, SMS messages, instant messages, tweets and content posted or published on websites, or social media accounts. The term documents also includes audio recordings, video recordings, photographs, and electronically stored information. When used with reference to a person, the term identify includes listing not only that person's full name, but also that person's last known addresses, telephone numbers, and email addresses, and to, communication, to a communication or document. The term identify includes not only the name or a title of the document, or if none, a brief description of the nature and content of the document, the date on which it was generated and or received and the identity of its authors and recipients. So roles of documentary evidence then apply here since the court would then have to analyze the kind of investigation conducted here. So interrogatories would be to identify all persons who assist or participate in the answering of interrogatories served on you in the above numbered cause of action, meaning who participate in the investigation apart from Denbo and the complainants. So interrogatory number two, identify all persons associated with or participating in the investigation Quote, unquote. Reference in the February 11, 2019 tweet posted to Funimation. Interrogatory number three. Identify all persons participating in the decision to post the February 11, 2019 tweets to Funimation. Meaning if Sony was involved in this, who is from Sony and who is from Funimation? Interrogatory number four. Identify all persons participating participating in Funimations, in informing Anime News Network that plaintiff's employment or contractual relationship has been terminated or otherwise ended. So who decided on informing or at least sending a PR, a press release to Anime News Network about the termination of employment? So, and then request for reproduction. The interrogatories usually involve persons and the request involves documents. And then, as for Jamie Markey, interrogatories and requests. Identify all persons who assist or participate in the answer interrogatories on you in the above numbered cause of action, meaning, um, what pieces of evidence were used, who were the witnesses, and then identify, yeah, speaking of witnesses, identify all persons who witnessed plaintiff's um, sexual assault or plaintiff's assault, which you alleged in the tweet you posted on Twitter handle Marky Mark on February 8, 2019. Identify the half a dozen women, half a dozen women you personally know who came forward with accounts as you like it in the tweet you posted to Marky Mark on February 8, 2019 because as the information she claimed, now she is then challenged to provide proof. And then identify the date you first met plaintiff. It might be explained later on in the course of the case, why? Then identify all email addresses, including respective domain names you have used between the more recent of the date you first met plaintiff or January 1, 2014 and the present. All dates that are involved here, they're very particular. So interrogatory number six, identify all social media handles and usernames and associated social media platforms or sites 
you have used between the more recent and the date you first met plaintiff and the present, meaning, do you have any other Twitter accounts apart from Marky Mark? Do you have any other social media accounts apart from the ones that had the username Marky Mark? And then request, of course, documents that fall in the rules of documentary evidence. And then, Monica Real, interrogatory number one. Identify all persons who assist or participate in the answering of interrogatories, quite similar to that of Marky. And then, identify each instance when plaintiff took a fistful of hair, head back, either whispered so closely to your ear that his lips were touching your or kiss your cheek or neck as you alleg it in the tweet you posted to Realisms, to Twitter handle Realisms on February 19, 2019. So if only the date of the tweet can be was identified, she is then required to provide the dates and the time that each of those instances happened. Because she just mentioned that they happened, she did not mention when they happened. And here is a prayer invoking the court that, yeah, make her provide those dates. So interrogatory number three, identify all persons who witnessed the incidents identified in your answer. Because the sad thing about certain accusations is it's easy to claim that you were a victim of sexual assault. Then again, if no witness would corroborate your statement, then there would be doubt. There would be reasonable doubt to your claim. Interrogatory number four, identify the instance in the mid 2000s. Mid 2000s is a very broad time frame, including the name of the convention. When plaintiff grabbed you and kissed you in his hotel room, as you alleged in the tweet you posted on the same Twitter handle on February 19th. Oh, okay. Interrogatory number five. Identify all persons who witnessed the incident identified in your answer to interrogatory number four. Who are your witnesses? And then interrogatory number six. Identify the three of your close friends who came forward and shared their stories with you. After the premiere for the Broly movie, as you alleged in the tweet you posted to Realisms, on February 19, 2019. Yes, name them. So interrogatory number six, or number seven rather, identify the investigators with whom you chose to share your testimony as you alleged in the tweet you posted to Realisms on February 19, 2019. Similar to one of the demands or one of the interrogatories posted under Funimation. And then number eight, identify the date you first met plaintiff. Same explanation for as this is the same interrogatory found in uh, under Jamie Markey. And then number nine, identify all email addresses, including respective domain names you have used between the more recent, the date you first met plaintiff, and the present, like do you have other Twitter handles? And then number 10, identify all social media handles and usernames and the associated social media platforms or sites you have used between the more recent of the day the first met plaintiff or on January 1, 2014 and the present. Similar to number nine. And then request documents that are applicable. This is actually more similar with the uh, request uh, for Funimation since Funimation conducted the uh, investigation. Monica Real was mentioned as one of the complainants where she herself said that it happened to her and she and her co complaint was actually the main um, fulcrum that was used uh, for the investigation. So yeah, provide the documents. 
obviously rules of electronic evidence would also fall under here and then okay so including the native format between you and the investigators identified in your answer to interrogatory number seven and then finally Ron Toye interrogatories and requests this would be quite numerous since whether or not it was proven that he was an employee of animation since he's been tweeting the most compared to those who are confirmed employees of the company he had a lot to answer for so one identify all persons who assist or participate in the answering of interrogatory served on you in the above numbered cause of action because if he can identify me, he is either an agent or an employee of the company. Because if this is supposed to be confidential information, why does he have access to that? And he cannot always use the reason that he is the fiancé. Interrogatory number two. Identify each instance of at least four assaults and at least four accounts. You alleged plaintiff committed in the tweets you posted to Twitter handle Rontoye on January 31, 2019, February 1, 2019, and February 21, 2019. Interrogatory number three. Identify each person you allege plaintiff assaulted in your answer to interrogatory number two. You can already tell that uh, Ty Beard and his associates have started classifying the tweets, all 400 tweets, into what was said, who told what, and what was alleged. And then number four, identify each of the four friends, of your friends, you claim plaintiff forced himself on as alleged in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye, replying to one Twitter handle, the Joker, TWB et al. Since, as I've mentioned a while ago, he's replying constantly. It's as if he has so much time on his hands. All he did all day is reply to tweets. So, and all of them dated February 6, 2019. There are several tweets, all replies dated February 6. And then number five, quite belated since... Um, he had to identify each of the incidents described as stuff he has done in the hotel room multiple times and an office or two in the tweet he posted to Ron Toye, replying to another Twitter user dated February 6, 2019. Interrogatory number six, identify each instance of the over 100 accounts of assault you alleged plaintiff committed in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye on February 4, 2019. Yeah, identify 100 accounts. Identify all 100 complainants of sexual assault that he claimed in the tweet. And then interrogatory number seven. Identify each of the 100 plus ladies you asserted had come forward or were coming forward in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye replying to at Tyler Ripley too and realisms on February 6, 2019. That's a lot of names. Interrogatory number eight. Identify each instance comprising the assaults the public isn't aware of as you alleged in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye Replying to Nightler, Marky Mark, et al. on February 23, 2019. Interrogatory number five. Okay, where's this? Okay, interrogatory number nine. Identify each instance of plaintiff robbing fans. As you alleged in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye. Replying to Marky Mark, Coffee Guy Jin et al. February 23. On the tweet dated February 23, 2019. And very particular. 
And then interrogatory number 10, identify each instance of plaintiff forcing himself on people in a sexual manner without consent and that resulted in assault. As you alleged in the tweet you posted to at Rontoye on April 7, 2019. Then interrogatory number 11, identify the date you first met plaintiff. Oh, there's more. Interrogatory number 12, identify each incident of an investigation into plaintiff's behavior or conduct in which you have participated between the more recent, the date you first met plaintiff or January 1, 2014 and the present. Interrogatory number 13, identify all email addresses, including respective domain names you have used between the more recent of the date you first, first, first met plaintiff or January 1 and the present. Interrogatory number 14, identify all social media handles and usernames and the associated social media platforms or sites you have used between the more recent uh, the date you first met plaintiff or January 1, 2014 and the present. And here we go with the request. This is more like a detailed version of the documentary request to Monica Real and to Funimation except more detailed since as I've mentioned a while ago, he tweeted the most. He had the most tweets defaming um, or mentioning that uh, Vic Mignon was a predator, that he sexually assaulted this person, that person, without mentioning any names. So, yeah. Quite related. It's very much related to the interrogatories. So, what opportunities are here for you then? Well, there is a demand for virtual assistance with a legal background. What involves legal-based research anyway? As you may have noticed in the way I divided the document here. First, the facts. The part that focuses on what happened and who got inconvenienced. Like, if this is murder, who got killed and who were the survivors or the people that complained of this person murdering their family member or their friend? Or if it's if it involves, for example, this case defamation, who got defamed and what proof that he does he have that defamation happened? And then of course the issue. This part mentions what the complainant or plaintiff wanted the court to do as remedy. Um, although in local case digest, it, they would simply say whether there was defamation or not. And then of course there would be an argument. This usually is a part that aptly says decision. That is if you're summarizing a case digest into um, what happened and what the complainant would like to happen and uh, the argument on or the decision what what was the decision that the court uh, used as basis in their decision so of course I mentioned here that it's argument because as you have noticed in the document that I just read and there was it mentioned what happened it mentioned what they wanted to happen and then they mentioned their legal basis useful legal provisions and previous decisions of the supreme court although in that uh, document they have legal provisions decision supreme court that might come later in the in um, in other documents but for most of the cases i just that i've read they make sure that they have bases uh, founded on Supreme Court decisions. So yeah. Okay. So which niche works best for you? So yeah, because 
I remember some a virtual assistant asking me about some potential clients that they have and then they discovered that some of these potential clients are lawyers and then the moment that they learn that they are lawyers then I just have to verify later on what niche do they work for so I would say classifying each niche based on the subjects that I take on the bar exams as enumerated here political law it's, it's a niche I'm familiar with since I, I have a degree in political science and then labor law. This might be familiar to you because it involves um, unfair labor practice and legal termination and legal recruitment to some extent. That part of labor law often overlaps with criminal law for obvious reasons. And then there's civil law. Um, I mentioned civil law a while ago in uh, in this in this discussion since it involves torts and damages and then taxation it's a, it's usually a combination of a computation and the theory most of the time theory because he, theory comes in whenever some appeals had to be applied jurisdiction and um, whether certain taxes apply on certain properties. And then of course, mercantile law. This is uh, quite commonly, I, I know some virtual assistants that have been assigned topics about insurance and they usually have to be familiar with insurance law since it's one good starting point in explaining insurance apart from explaining to people that what if we die tomorrow what what legacy would you leave behind uh, to your family and then of course corporation law is involved transportation law intellectual property law um, anti-money laundering app and then the financial rehabilitation app I forgot FRIA is for, but it's often cons um, discussed in bar review sessions uh, under mercantile law or commercial law. Some lecturers would rather call it commercial law because financial rehabilitation is often a, a remedy for corporations under distress. And then, of course, criminal law self explanatory. Uh, I remember some project-based clients I have in the past um, asking about criminal law. Then it's a one-time thing. And then remedial law, possibly the toughest subject uh, in law school. And then legal and judicial ethics. Uh, there are some uh, virtual assistants that get to know this because topics include anything that can subject a member of the bar to disciplinary action, or in worst cases, disbarment by the Supreme Court. So if your future clients are lawyers, they will be dependent on you for the data, mostly with verifying information. If not the law itself, the, ga the case digest related to the tasks currently handled. So, for more VA opportunities, as always, you have to click the link on the description box. You can thank me later. And for any other questions, violent reactions, uh, concerns, and maybe some uh, possible topics on season two, you may simply drop a comment. Don't forget to like and share this, uh, this clip. And I will be seeing you on the next season. Have a good weekend and uh, stay safe. Also, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers uh, currently watching right now. Thank you.